Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV, and I'm here at RSA 2014 in San Francisco on the show floor. I have a co host with me today, Mr. Joe McRae. He is the Chief Technical Officer with Secure Ninja. And Joe and I will be interviewing Sean Bodmer. He is the Chief Researcher with Counterattack. Sean, how are you today? Oh, very well, thank you. Thank you for asking. Definitely. A lot thank going on. You. Yes, so much going on. Thanks for speaking with us. I know My you pleasure. have a book signing coming up in a few minutes. Yes, uh, for Reverse Deception, uh, we actually take uh, traditional human intelligence and counterintelligence methodologies and, and apply them to cyber so uh, to enable uh, security professionals to get out of that defensive posture and start taking action to push attackers out of the network. Excellent. That Does that amazing. sound cool, Joe? Amazing. Hey, Sean, I wanted to ask you a question. I was on Ancestry.com yesterday, yeah. and I actually found out that we were related. Well, that would explain a lot of things then, sir. I appreciate the lineage. Thanks, man. That would man. explain a lot yes, of things. Yes, it would. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Sean, I actually just wanted to ask you a couple of questions. Yep. You know, yep. there's a lot of buzz right now going on about really big data breaches like Target and some of these kind of things. Like, if you had to like sum up in just a couple of words, you know, what are your thoughts on what's causing these big breaches? What, what are people doing wrong? They're spending lots of money. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of international companies that are implementing weak operating systems. So when you think uh, you're going to the airport, you see these airlines that are running, uh, you know, Windows XP. You go to Target, you go to these uh, companies, and you're at the register. You see Windows XP or these old operating systems that they kind of forget about because they're looking at the, the the software on top that's managing that organization's operation. So it, it's uh, improper implementation of uh, effective security controls on the, those workstations. No way, no way. So when people do put these security controls in place, are, you're, you're telling me that they're not often implemented properly? Properly Is that why they're easy to bypass? Or what exactly causes that? Well, uh, most of the time you think about these large uh, you know, uh, scale organizations where they kind of set it and forget it, right? So, so they, they deploy the workstations, they deploy this uh, software on top or maybe some point of sale software, and they Forget about it. And you think all these you know, uh, cash registers or workstations around the world, wherever they may be, they have someone actually has to go and update those. And they, you know, do they properly maintain that? More often, we see what happens. Right. They get breached. Now, this is some intense stuff, Sean. How is it that you gather this information from these hackers? Like, how do you even know where they hang out? So, uh, yeah, as I've lectured before uh, on, at, uh, on stage at various conferences, I've spent about 50% of my time, uh, you know, in the in the mix, in the forums. Uh, I've assumed multiple uh, undercover, underground identities. Like you think of these uh, DEA agents who go undercover and hang out with the the, the narco traffickers and the cartels. I do the same thing, and I've been doing this for several years. Where I go hang out with these uh, criminals in a forum, I, and I help uh, review the code that they're writing and working on, and who's selling what. And what you know? What accounts are, are, are they accepting payments? And you know, so um, as in May 2012, I was able to track down uh, a, a group from the Rob Nix D with the help of some other security professionals, and we tracked down uh, 5.6 million dollars of stolen money from U.S. citizens uh, through the Rob Nix D uh, uh, crime war campaign. Wow. And so they actually seized that money and took it back. I wanted to ask you about that. So you've been doing this for a long time, and. You know, you've really gained a lot of notoriety in this space, and you also even got to brief like executives, yeah. Congress. Yes, sir. When you're when you're briefing people like that, what are the things that you're trying to convey to them? So that no matter. What the bricks that, that everyone seems to be building, you know, IT budgets are getting bigger and bigger every year. You know, you have to buy this new tool. It's like a brick, right? So these companies and organizations are building this huge wall of defense, you know, tool by tool by tool with, you know, all logical bricks. But then you can't see what's on the other side coming at you and you're trying to hold everything out and but everything's still coming through. So how do you really deal with that? And when it, the, the bigger wall you build, the more stuff gets through because you have more tools to deal with. So uh, it's really understanding the threat, and that's why I spend a lot of my own time with not even you know it's not a requirement to go out and learn what the uh, criminal are doing, the criminal mindset. And that criminal by them, you mean China, right? I mean, come on, it's oh come on, no, no, no. I mean, well, it, it's not just. It, it, I mean, 
I mean, think about what Edward Snowden just released. I mean, hey, so so you know, in our own backyard, we were doing the same thing. You know, we we're, we're throwing stones in a glass house, right? right? So I mean, there's countries. Every country does espionage. Every country in the world that has a military looking to be a world power does espionage at some level. I mean, General Alexander has says, hey, CNE, computer network exploitation, is just a thing, right? And and we, now we know why they redefined all that thanks to Edward Snowden. Right. Thanks, Ed. Uh, but uh, you know, so, but, but there's a lot of problems, you know, with the world. With you know, so we can't just point fingers. But yes, there is a threat to our you know infrastructure from major countries like yeah, China and Russia and you know all the major players who want to be a world power. So this is my third year here at RSA, and every year it seems to be like the biggest buzzword is APT. Do you think companies are now doing the right things to protect themselves against this persistent threat? Uh, I believe companies are a little bit more aware that, that so many major public players in the technology space have come forward and said, hey, we've been pwned, and here you go, here's some information about it. And uh, I think the industry is reacting well. I, I think uh, one of the few issues that, that we're seeing is, you know, as I mentioned, that those that proverbial brick. Uh, of defensive tools that they're just layering in every year. Uh, so, you know, and I don't like the term APT because, uh, you know, it, you have advanced threats, you have persistent threats. It's either or when you look at the tools that were actually implemented in, uh, you know, some of these campaigns. So when it comes down to it, it it's the tools that they're implementing every year and they're adding on top of it and are the tools giving you that right level of data so you know in my career one of the best tools I've ever seen is a honeypot or a honey net uh, to provide you that that full impact analysis of what occurred without any of the operational uh, danger uh, to your network and, and you know tools that enable you to have that level of granularity of detail I mean, there aren't many companies that are doing that today. Okay. Now, what are, when you're chasing down hackers, what, what are the primary things that you're looking for? What, what's your driving focus when you're looking for something? Not talking technical, I'm talking methodology. So, so motive and intent, right? So, you know, every sample of, of malicious code out there has a specific goal or intent uh, that uh, it will exact on an operating system, uh, like an effect. So, uh, what I do is I look across broad classes of, of malicious code to to identify the actual motive and intent of the malware. So, okay, um, you know, you can you know, have metamorphic code, polymorphic code, change itself, its signature patterns, whatever, but it's still, at the end of the day, it has an effect on that system and what it was pre-programmed to do. So taking that one sample and going, ah, is it the same as these? What is it going after? The money, your, you know, your files? Is it trying to set up remote access into this highly secure network? So the actual motive and intent, the meaning of the malware is much more important than the actual malware itself. Okay. Hey, Sean, you and I used to work at a similar place, one of these secret squirrel places many, yes. many moons yes. ago. Yes, yes. And there was a term back then called effects-based operations. Yes. Are you seeing that type of thing, uh, those types of tactics, maybe not exactly the way that we were accustomed to it back where we used to work, but is that still going on, or, or maybe you can expound upon that? So, uh, yes, so effects-based operations, um, you know, laying down suppressing fire. Like, uh, so logically, certain criminal groups will lay out scans constantly or just flood a network with a, a campaign to infect as many users as they can and, you come and pump and dump that network in a matter of 24 hours or a few days and lay in a few extra samples of malware that embed themselves for long-term persistence, which then spread back out. And we've seen this time and time again. Um, so yes, laying that type of suppression fire, you know, even in uh, the government space, you know, uh, while working at Dumbala, uh, a few years ago, we would actually see that information, you know, being spread back out. Mm -hmm. And then here at, at Counterattack, we can still see the same level from the endpoint out. So seeing how these organizations are just these criminal groups are pushing out malware and pushing out uh, noise across the enterprise, mm -hmm. yeah, to keep the security professionals busy, keep them tied up with all the little stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. Now, Sean, I can't help but notice you're rocking some pretty cool tats there. Do you want to tell us about them? Oh, yeah, sure. So uh, this is my homage to my Eastern European brethren here. So this is from the USA, and this is uh, with love, and this is in uh, Russian uh, uh, lead speak jargon, Hacker XOR Life. So it's... Hacker for life. And this is my homage to everyone in Russia, all my uh, minds that are uh, my adversaries. Yep. 
Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you, gentlemen. Nothing thank but love for you, man. Thanks for all the cool uh, stuff you do, And we'll do the Dougie later. We'll do the Dougie oh later. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They're going to do the Dougie later. All right. Oh, my gosh. Um, everyone at home, make sure you don't miss anything that Security Ninja TV is producing here at RSA. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We even have an Instagram account these days, so you've got to check out that. I'm Alicia Webb. This is Joe McRae. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by SecureNinja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.